So our next speaker is Lucas Villarreal, who will be talking about user-defined functions for HDF5. So Lucas, it's yours. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so good morning, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm gonna present to you a framework uh, that allows one to attach functions uh, defined by the user uh, into HDF5 and how uh, that's going to change the way that you interact with scientific uh, data sets in general. So uh, as you are probably aware, uh, traditional HDF5 application provides a piece of data, such as a numerical grid, as input to the right function. And uh, such a grid may take several gigabytes or even terabytes of storage uh, space. And when the application needs to read that data back, uh, it issues a read operation and gets that piece of data in its original form. Uh, User-defined functions, on the other hand, let applications uh, provide a piece of code that contains instructions on how to generate a data set. Uh, and those instructions are uh, compiled into a loadable object form, such as a, a shared library or a bytecode. And that is uh, what's actually started on this. And here we have a first fact about UDF data sets. Uh, they are tidy in comparison to a regular data set. And uh, they usually just require uh, a few kilobytes of storage space. Uh, from the perspective of an HDF5 aware application, uh, UDF datasets look just the same uh, as a regular dataset. They are named, they are typed, they have dimensions, and they can be read using the very same traditional APIs. Uh, however, underneath uh, reading and UDF is slightly different uh, because we actually have, uh, as shown here in this picture, uh, uh, load operation triggering uh, the loadable object to be uh, you know, brought from disk. Uh, then we invoke a UDF handler that executes the compiled code. And finally, it populates the output data set and provides that data to the application. And all of this uh, happens on the fly. Uh, and here comes a second fact about the UDF data sets. They are dynamic by nature. Uh, it is possible to write UDFs that give a different output uh, each time they are read. Uh, you can have UDFs that take environment variables into account, so they can be quite dynamic. Uh, you can have UDFs that read the data from external sensors, uh, from you know, uh, any data source, as I will show you later. So there's quite a, a lot of difference underneath uh, about how a UDF behaves in comparison to a regular data set. Uh, underneath the technology that's uh, enabling uh, UDF to come to life uh, is uh, the IO filter pipeline uh, from HDF5. Uh, those uh, are usually uh, going to take uh, two paths. So you have the right path in which the filter compresses data, uh, and you have the read path in which the application reads decompressive data. In our case, the plugins are going to behave uh, in a different way. In the right path, we compile and store the piece of code that was provided by the user. And on the read path, we execute that code and populate the data set. Uh, this is the architecture of user-defined functions at a glance. So we have the HDF5 application on the top. Uh, that same application is possible uh, to read regular data sets or to read and write UDF data sets. Uh, we have three backends today. Uh, one of them allows uh, users to write UDFs in C++. Uh, underneath, we invoke GCC or the CLang compiler uh, that produces a shared library, which we also compress. So it's quite tiny. Uh, and then uh, that's uh, the object that we open at runtime and execute. We also have a backend uh, that allows Lua uh, to be supported. So you can write a Lua code. Uh, that code is processed by LuaJIT, which is a just-in-time compiler, and it generates a bytecode. And at runtime, uh, the execution is assisted by the LuaJIT VM. And we also have support for Python. Uh, this uh, particular backend uses the CPython implementation, which produces a bytecode. And then at runtime, we use the CPython VM. Uh, for those writing user-defined functions, uh, we have uh, a very simple API. It's, uh, it consists of an entry point. Uh, and four basic uh, API. Uh, the first is uh, an API that lets you get uh, a pointer to a data set. So it's called get data and you provide the name of that uh, data set. 
The second is uh, get dims, which lets you get an array with the dimensions of that data set. You can also have a, a function to retrieve the data, data set type. Uh, that's going to give you a description uh, like int 16, int 32, or compound. Uh, and uh, here is a special uh, observation to be made. So UDFs can be used to write and read uh, compound data sets. So you can create quite rich uh, representations using UDFs. And finally, we have a helper function to set uh, a value of a string member. Uh, for those uh, writing UDFs in Python, the API is quite simple. In this example, we have uh, three data sets being uh, retrieved using get data, and then we output uh, to see the combination of A and B. Very, very simple. Uh, C++ looks mostly the same. Uh, we just have a extern C. Uh, uh, declaration, and then we have a, a template function uh, where we specify what's the type of the data we are reading or writing to. Uh, and then in Lua, we have the very same API. The difference here is that Lua is uh, one based uh, when it comes to indexing. So it's the only difference. Uh, everything looks the same regardless of the uh, uh, backend that's uh, being used. Uh, and to compile uh, those uh, UDFs, you use a command line utility called HDF5 UDF, providing the name of the HDF5 file, the UDF file itself, which may be in Python, C++, or Lua, and then the description of the output data set. In this case, is C, this is the resolution, and then this is the data type. Uh, also, it's worth to note that uh, it is possible to use uh, OpenMP or even uh, MPI when writing uh, UDF. So, this is just a very simple example that I'm showing here, but you can use uh, all of the uh, power that the programming language gives to you. Uh, it is also possible to completely skip the command line and use uh, HDF5 UDFs uh, API to write uh, uh, UDFs into HDF5 files. Uh, here you uh, have the option to push a description of the data set you want to embed on HDF5 to compile and to store it. It is also possible to completely skip C programming if you're not into that and use Python bindings. Uh, so you can install those uh, Python bindings using pip. Uh, this is an example. You just import uh, the user defined function uh, uh, class and declare it uh, uh, with user defined function uh, and provide the input uh, files. Uh, here you push the data set the description, the name, the data type, the resolution, compile and start. That's it. Uh, all of those operations uh, that compile and start the data, uh, the UDF uh, 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 into HDF5, produce also metadata besides the, the, the bytecode. Uh, it's uh, from this metadata, which we also store on HDF5, that we know how to read the data back. And we know uh, which data sets have to be processed in order to enable the UDF to be executed properly. So we know this one depends on A and B. Uh, we know it's going to output C, so we have all of those information here. Also, it is uh, noteworthy that uh, UDFs are always signed. So we have a signature here of the uh, user who created this data set. Uh, and uh, this is uh, used uh, for validation purposes. So uh, we have since uh, HDF5 UDF 2.0 support for security profiles. So. UDF uh, comes with three different profiles. Uh, one of them is what we call the untrusted profile. It uh, basically denies access to uh, most, most system calls and to any file system access. We have a default profile, which has some sane defaults. It allows you to execute some system calls to access uh, Python modules and basic uh, system libraries like uh, SSL and math. And we have a trusted prof profile that lets uh, the user execute anything. Uh, and it's uh, quite simple to uh, navigate uh, on this uh, set of profiles. They are basically directories. Uh, you have a JSON file describing the rules uh, under each uh, of those profiles. And you have a public key uh, associated uh, with each of those directories. So each time you receive a new file, for example, uh, from a third party, uh, once HDF5 UDF loads that uh, UDF data set, it extracts the public key, it uh, attempts to uh, validate that public key to make sure that uh, the, the data set has been signed by that key indeed. And once it's been validated that it's been signed by that key, it, uh, it associates that new 
uh, publicly with the deny or the uh, untrusted profile. So by default, uh, new uh, UDFs that have never seen before are not going to be allowed to execute uh, 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 system calls that the user does not uh, feel comfortable with. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, support for a sandbox environment. So all of those UDFs execute in a confined environment uh, that uh, basically terminates the process if it violates uh, the profile rules. On Linux, this is accomplished using seccomp and ptrace. Uh, we have uh, also as of uh, HDF5 UDF 2.1 support for Windows and Mac. Uh, but the only limitation of those uh, two parts is that we do not have uh, support for sandbox yet. Uh, so here I want to show you a use case in uh, extract, transform, and load pipelines. Uh, as you know, it, uh, those are uh, pipelines that are quite uh, common in data processing. You typically have a collection of input coming from uh, IoT devices or object storage and so on. You have then uh, raw data, which you want to extract. Uh, information from. Usually that involves uh, data format translation. You want to transform it, to cleanse it, to aggregate data from other data sets, normalize, and so on. And then you load it into the final system. Uh, so this is uh, showing you that data is produced on all stages of the pipeline. Uh, and then uh, it is possible to use UDFs to replace some of those uh, elements. And I'm going to show you uh, how this is accomplished. Uh, so the difference here is that data is produced only when it's needed uh, and not uh, as a default uh, uh, procedure of the ETL pipeline. Uh, so let me share my demo with you. Hope you can see this. So uh, here we have an example I'm going to show you here. Uh, we are starting with a data set that only has a static data set. It's called gradient one. Then we have a virtual data set that is taking input from a GeoTIFF file. Uh, this is showing you a data virtualization, right? So we are taking input from this data source.tiff. We are creating a virtual geotiff uh, data set as output. And here we compile it and we produce a, uh, uh, a new uh, UDF data set. Now we see uh, that a virtual geotiff is asso associated with the UDF filter. Now we are calling a second uh, uh, UDF that's going to blend the gradient data set, which is a regular data set with the virtual geotiff. Uh, and besides uh, doing this blend, we are printing here a message, hey, I'm blending the raw data. And uh, what we do is we are multiplying uh, one data set with the other. So here we execute it, we produce the new data set. And now we have a third uh, procedure, which is going to take the blended data set, uh, going to produce a transformed data set, which is basically going to reverse the blended one. So here we are going to compile it, voila. And then uh, now we're going to load uh, those data sets uh, into Saga GIS, which is a, a, a GIS platform uh, open source. Uh, this is the gradient that is a static data set. Now we are going to load the virtual GeoTIFF. So it's actually reading underneath from GeoTIFF file, and it's a uh, using just the, the HDF5 interface uh, to enable uh, reads. Uh, now we are going to read the blended data set, which is combining them. There you go. And finally, uh, and you can see that uh, there is this blending raw data message printed on the console. And now we're going to uh, load the transformed data set. And you can see here that uh, both the blending raw data and the transforming data uh, messages has been shown. So uh, basically, we have this uh, entire pipeline of transformations uh, uh, or UDFs being executed when you uh, load uh, a chained set of uh, UDFs. Uh, OK, so uh, also, I want to show you something. We have one minute left. Great, uh, just in time. So I want to show you something different today. Uh, so you have seen how uh, it is possible to load uh, uh, data from external files and so on. But here is something new. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, shows you how to retrieve data from a server, uh, such as a, a server uh, on the internet. So I'm starting with a brand new data set. It's an empty data set. Uh, and what I have here is a UDF that connects uh, using the Telnet protocol to localhost on port 23. And then I'm going to read uh, 
message. Uh, I'm looking for a start and end marker. And then I'm going to basically consume the frame that's uh, within it. And I will create here an output data set called Star Wars. And I'm going to populate this data set, which is a string based data set with the contents of the frame that I just read. And here I'm going to compile it. Uh, and now I'm going to start the Telnet server. And now I'm going to load the data set by invoking h5dump in a loop. I'm just discarding the header, reading the Star Wars data set, uh, and just sleeping a little bit so you can get a sense of animation. And there you go. Uh, here you have a, a, a Star Wars in ASCII art uh, uh, played by HDF5. So, uh, of course, I'm not expecting anyone to play uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, movie uh, using HDF5, but it shows you the power of HDF5, uh, especially UDFs in, in general. So it is possible to create uh, services that do whatever you want. It is up to your imagination. Uh, and also, uh, it is automatically going to save you uh, storage and lead you to faster data transfer uh, if what you're uh, wrapping up in a UDF is a simplification of a process that would usually generate a lot of data. Uh, so yeah, I think this is it. Uh, I welcome you to visit the web page of the project. Uh, also check the examples we have. And yeah, uh, this is it. I i am happy to hear any comments uh, that you might have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was discussion in the chat window, but I believe Gerd answered the question. So the idea was um, if it's possible to store a uh, load, loadable file with, within uh, HDF5 uh, from Graham Winter. So I don't know Sorry. if Graham, do you want to ask more or your question was resolved? So um, yeah, it's, essentially it was quite simple that we support external users uh, with, um, so with, with, sorry, with the Eiger detector, we use the BitShuffle LZ4 uh, compression, which is obviously not included in the standard library. And there's always the problem of having to make sure that the user at the other end has got that plugin available. But obviously if you can embed it into the HDF5 libraries, then you needn't worry about it because it would you know, it, sorry, it, it embed it into the HDF5 file. So that essentially, you know, the, the library itself could go, what's the plugin I need? Oh, it's here, without having to have it somewhere in the system path, which means if you modify the library or modify the compression in the future, it could actually be automatically updated by simply adding the new plugin into right. the file. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously, you know, that, that, would, that would be um, work. But it sounds like it's the sort of thing that could be done here, except um, Gerd pointed out that this only works on single chunk data sets. And obviously, exactly. you know, if, we're, if we're dealing with, you know, tens of gigabytes, that's, that's many, many chunks. It tends to be, you know, 10,000 10, chunks, say. So, yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, so, so one, of, one of the pieces of uh, future work uh, that uh, uh, are being planned is to uh, convert the filter-based uh, implementation into a vol driver. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, possibly going to enable you to have uh, uh, smaller chunks, uh, so you may have different uh, use cases uh, being enabled by that implementation. So you okay. will no longer have to pull the entire data set from, from disk. Okay. But yeah, it, it, was, it was an interesting idea, but um, obviously not possible, not possible today. Thank you. It, it might be possible, though, if you could. I like the idea, uh, your idea of um, Sort of uh, shipping the the uh, uh, filter, the plugin with the HDF5 file, maybe uh, to get around this single si uh, single chunk limitation. Maybe you just have sort of a fake data set where reading from it would basically bootstrap the extraction process, and then it would yep. be available. And uh, so it would be like a dummy, like a bootstrap data set, like a readme file, where you said, before you do anything else, bootstrap this thing. And that might actually, ext of course, there, there would be an additional security risk, but um, that's taken care of already with the signing and so forth that could extract that plugin into the plugin path, for example, and then you would be good to go. 
I mean, the, the, the art of this would be having all of that handled invisibly by the HGF5 libraries. Yeah. Right. So, right. The, I mean, you could do this with a virtual data set, I guess, is you could have the virtual data set encode what you've just described. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, that's, okay. we're possibly going a long way off topic. I mean, we have a very compact amount of time. Yes, but the, uh, this is idea worth discussing um, because it is a problem that users get files with the compression that they have to search for uh, and install. So it is really the, the good problem to solve. Uh, unfortunately, it's um, I can stop here. Questions, please continue via chat uh, or send it to us. 